You are listening to the On Purpose Podcast. Welcome to this week's edition of the On Purpose Podcast, where it's always our mission to become the most impactful podcast in the world. And today I'm honored to have a very special guest with me, Kimberly Archie. Kimberly is a legal consultant, a sport risk management expert, an author, and a mother who has been at the forefront of some of the most important issues in our society. She's a founder of several organizations that advocate for the safety and well-being of children athletes, such as the National Cheer Safety Foundation, USA Sports Safety, Child Athlete Advocates, and the Faces of CTE. She's also, where a lot of you may recognize her name, she's also a former employee of Tom Girardi, the disgraced lawyer who's accused of embezzling millions of dollars from his clients. She's been featured on the news documentary, The Housewife and the Hustler, where she exposed the truth about his fraud and corruption. Kimberly is a courageous and inspiring woman who has overcome many challenges in her life and who is dedicated to making a positive difference in the world. In this episode, we're going to talk about her journey, her insights, and her advice on living life on purpose. Please welcome to this week's edition of the show, Kimberly Archie. Kimberly, welcome to the On Purpose Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here, my friend. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I am. Uh, this, this is going to be a fun episode. I was really um, interested, obviously, getting ready to, to bring you on and, and talk with you. And I was like, okay, we got uh, some work to do here. We got uh, some good stuff to talk about. And one of the things that I noticed was a theme is you seem to really have some tenacity for underdogs. <laughs> that would be a fair statement. <laughs> and and I, I love that. I'm like, oh, I love when people stand up for others and when, when um, you know, we just don't use our experiences or our knowledge or our expertise to benefit us. But when we look at, okay, how can we share this with the world and help people that maybe don't have access to some of the stuff we've been blessed to have access to. And that was really one of the things that resonated with me about your story and getting ready for this. And I want to give you, you credit for, for seeing that and being willing to step into that. Well, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. But before we get to the big, heavy, you know, the heavy lifting of the story, I like to think about the purposeful delivery here. I like to have a little warm up, a little kind of rapid fire question. So I get to know and our community gets to know a little bit about Kimberly and some of the stuff maybe you haven't been asked before. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. Go for it. All right. These are quick now. All right. Here we go. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Mm, what kind of coffee? Do you have a preference? Black. French press, black, strong. Oh, strong. Okay, because you're you're drinking that, and then you're getting ready to go to work. Yes, and <laughs> and I pick coffee over anything, really. So <laughs> coffee's number one. All right, fair enough. All right, brunch or liner? Brunch. Brunch. Okay. Favorite thing you're doing there? Brunch wise. Are you like? Uh, what do they call it? Mimosas on Sunday, like relaxing day? No you... mimosas. I don't really like to put juice in champagne. <laughs> I'm a straight champagne girl, but um, <laughs> breakfast is my favorite meal, and I'm not a big eater really early. I do a protein shake, so like every day is brunch to me. <laughs> nice. Sun rises or sunsets? Ooh, that's hard. I, I'm a sun chaser. Okay. Uh, I'm a photographer, so I love the sun and photos of the sun. Um, but and that's tough. I mean, I love sunsets, but there is something special about a sunrise. Uh, I'm just not as much of a morning person. So I guess <laughs> I'll have to say sunset. <laughs> All right. Do you, are you a reader of physical books or an audio listener of books? Nowadays? Physical books. Oh my God. Yeah. I hate digital. I read, I read anything, but. Okay. 100% I'm a physical book person. There's something special about um, a book itself. And I think it's a lost art to some degree. And, uh, and I hope to see a comeback of printed books being more of the norm rather than digital. 
Mm, interesting. Why do you think it's a lost art? What makes you say that? Because I feel like, um, you know, we're really into audio books, which I know is helpful for people who have, um, you know, um, challenges in reading for a number of reasons or people listening to audio while they're in the car and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I just like, I mean, you can't replace, I mean, if you've ever walked into someone's house, and they have a lot, you know, one of those rooms that's a library and the mm. walls are just nothing but books. I mean, is there anything more beautiful than one of those rooms? I don't know. That's true. Yeah, I agree. And and I, I know you're a co-author in a book and, and we released a book a couple of years ago. I think seeing the tangible product to me is, is really rewarding. Knowing like somebody's whole ideas and thoughts and hours and hours of effort went into creating this thing I'm holding in my hand that I can't get digitally. Well, and digital, you can change. Like, so for mm. example, for somebody who does a lot of research in legal cases, which I'm sure we'll get into later, but one of the things that I do in my research that's unique to maybe another legal researcher is I love to go into the archives of newspapers because once it's been printed in a newspaper and it's out there, you can't go back to 1976 and alter it. It is what it is. Now that a lot of stories are only digital, somebody with influence or power or control to go and change a story and to alter um, history. And so to me, the printed word is very important. Mm, yeah, I never actually thought about that, but you're absolutely right. That's a good point. All right, one last question here for you. Dogs or cats? Dogs. I'm definitely a doggy person, although I love all animals, but I feel like cats are very feminine and sort of like a female-ish character, regardless of gender. Sure. So I just feel like doggies are a better <laughs> match for me. Otherwise, we got too much feminine and we're going to war. Plus, cats are like, I think they run us. You know, dogs are loyal. Oh, yeah. And they can't wait for you to get home. Like, I've never had a cat. My daughter had a cat. They don't run up to greet you when you get home. <laughs> a dog, you could be gone five minutes, and you get, like, the best welcome as if you've been gone for 20 years. So I got to say dogs. That's true. You got a particular breed you like? I am a basset hound lover. You know, the dog oh, yeah. with the big, giant ears. That's the last dog that I had. Right now, I'm kind of eyeing um, – a Cavapoo, which is a King Cavalier mixed with Poodle. Yeah. So I think that would be my next dog. They kind of got me wrapped around their finger. So <laughs> we'll see that. But I think that's next. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, we had a Basset Hound when our children were younger, and then we recently adopted a Golden Doodle. Uh, he just turned one. So very great dogs. Yeah, the Golden Doodles are adorable, too. My cousin has one. So I like the mix with Poodle. Uh, you know, I think they're great because you take the best of both. And if you don't like a lot of hair around your house, then the mix with the Poodle kind of minimizes that one. The only negative I think you could say about a dog is maybe cleaning up the hair. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're right. Yeah, the Poodle hybrid definitely keeps them clean and they do seem to come out with a lot of energy. That's the one thing I've noticed with most of the doodle uh, hybrids. I love it. Yeah. So Soon. You got to be ready I'm, to I'm work. Weak. Yeah. They're not going to be like the <laughs> basset hound laying around waiting for you. They're going to want to go running and stuff. At least our golden doodle. He's very active with us. So I want to start with something. Obviously, it's in the news. I figured we, we kind of start with this, and I really want to spend some time, Kimberly, talking about – what goes on behind the scenes, maybe what doesn't make the news or what people don't see. And that's the internal thought process, the internal conflicts we have when we, we step into things that are uncertain. So I wanted to, to start with asking you obviously about the Girardi Keys case and what is one of the biggest, um, I don't even know how to say my feelings on that, but anybody that steals from victims and makes victims a victim a second time, is it's hard to even fathom that it's humanly possible special place in hell for if you believe in the in hell and heaven and hell or whatever but it's a special place for people who do uh crimes like that in my opinion right so you, you had to have some satisfaction when they were recently 
the verdict recently came out of the, the ruling that he was competent to stand trial. Yeah. So what what didn't make the headlines and and probably was a good thing for me at the time for per se is that I did testify to um, one of the government's experts uh, against uh, Girardi in his competency hearing. I didn't have to testify in the hearing itself, but through the experts. So that was a that was probably lucky for me to um, not to have that sort of pressure, but. The judge did quote me in the ruling of ruling him competent, and it was um, probably the most important um, time that I've taken a stand in my entire career, in my life, because to me, it was very important that the victims of Girardi and Girardi Keith um, to get a chance at justice, that he would have to stand trial for his crimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just very important to get it right and to do the best job that I could. And I was the only person that knew him personally that testified against him. Let me ask, so you worked for him for, uh, am I right? About seven years uh, on and off. Yeah, I knew, I knew him. Um, I, well, I started being connected to him in 2008 and then I didn't start working with him until two, 2012. Um, I met him for the first time uh, in between there in 2010. So it started in 2012 that I formally started working with him on the NFL brain injury case. Most people have heard about that right. landmark um, settlement. And, um, and then until uh, I left in June of 2019. And, and so for, about seven and a half years. Okay. Yeah. And for some of our audience that maybe isn't familiar with that case, just you can Google it and you're going to pull up all kinds of information. But basically, if, if I summarize it real briefly, he was representing people in wrongful death type suits and, and civil litigations, getting uh, huge awards and then basically stealing from the settlement from the victim. Would that be a fair brief synopsis? Yeah, um, Girardi has 205 complaints beginning in the um, early mid 80s to the California bar for misappropriating funds from um, his clients on a repetitive basis. And because of his um, know how and power and connections, he was able to have a clean bar record uh, until just a couple of years ago. So, you know, I'm in my mid 50s. So since I was in middle school, he was stealing from clients. And we're not talking about pennies here. We're talking millions of dollars. Millions. Uh, yeah. You, when you see headlines, people will see, you know, 18 million is the amount connected to his indictment. But those are just four cases Crazy. to give people some context, which is sort of representative of all of the victims. But it isn't all of the victims. Um, I've had access to a number of the files now and some of the bank records, and I have yet to find a case that Jordy Keys wasn't stealing from clients. Mm. And I think what really astonished me studying this a little bit was not that he was doing that, right, which is shameful, but like you alluded to he was so well connected and had so many people with ties to him that it was consistently overlooked or just not paid attention to not given credence to because they were all related to him somehow yeah he, he was such a connected guy so when uh, to give people a little window into sort of the complexity of my own involvement my childhood best friend and who's still my best friend to this day we've been best friends over 50 years now. She always hates when I say that because it tells everybody how old we are, but <laughs> I love it. I don't, I don't care. Um, she was a client of uh, her family were, were clients of Girardi Keys. And um, so I knew of him and I was connected to him prior to them hiring him. Um, but once they hired him for a gas explosion that mm. happened in the Bay area, um, then you know, their involvement is what opened my eyes uh, to Girardi's fraud. So when my best friend Kathy came to me and was 
and she had mentioned things before, but when we had our first like really serious talk about could he be stealing from clients, including them, I was like, are you kidding? Like, ask me to take on anybody, but not Tom Girardi and not lawyers. You know, to me, at first I was like, well, would we even come out alive if we tried mm. to go against him? That's how powerful yeah. he was. I mean, he could call the governor. He knew Supreme Court justices. He knew politicians on both sides of the ball, so conservative and, you know, liberal and everyone in between. He knew the district attorney, the state attorney general, the chief of police would come. And, you know, I have a, I have a selfie with the chief of police at the Christmas party. You know, I'm thinking, who, who are we going to call? One of my quotes in a documentary is who are we going to call Ghostbusters? I mean, <laughs> who's going to back us up? Right. I mean, where are we going to go? Who's going to, and, and I was, de I definitely knew we couldn't go to the California bar. And now in hindsight, well, was that a true story? Uh, you know? Um, so to me, I think that's the thing that makes Girardi maybe unique to somebody else doing, uh, you know, naughty or criminal type activity mm -hmm. is that he had he had all the people that should have been investigating him on his side. Right. Yeah. Even up to the FBI, I saw where the FBI director in L.A. field office had to recuse himself. Yes. And that's that um, was scary, too. I mean, to not be able to go to the bar or the FBI, um, you know, right. what do you do? You're just kind of I, I used to tease my friend Kathy, you know, we're going to be 80 something years old rocking in our rocking chairs, drinking <laughs> our spiked iced tea and, and still mumbling about Girardi. And he was going to, he would have gotten away with it. I mean, that's how I envisioned it. I really couldn't see a, a fall from grace. Mm. Well, I just want to compliment you on having the courage to step up and to, to be the voice. Right. But I want to know what were the emotions going through you when you're like, okay, we've got to do this. If we don't take a stand, like you said, if, if we don't take a stand now, this will continue to go on and it'll be, continue to be more and more victims for the rest of our lifetime or until he passes, right? And who knows, he had such an infrastructure, it may have continued to go on beyond him. What was it like when you're like, okay, we are drawing the line in the stand and I got to be part of this? Well, I have definitely experienced every emotion that you can imagine. Um, but I would say like top three would be fear. I mean, I was scared to death. I think anyone could relate to that. Um, there was a lot of grief too. It was so sad to me to see somebody that at one time was seen as this hero that would take on these terrible corporations or so-called corruption and do that on behalf of somebody who didn't have really any or much power at all. It was just really sad to see, you know, one of the few, um, you know, so-called heroes in life was really not a hero at all. Um, so I would say fear and grief and then um, just, unbelievable it was hard to believe mm. uh we still uncover things every day that blow my mind away i always say like when am i going to stop being shocked <laughs> like, yeah. we've uncovered so many things like when will i finally just go oh, okay yeah sure uh we should expect to see more craziness um uh you know but every emotion that you can imagine I, it was just really it's been a mind-blowing experience this really started to unravel it's been just over five years now and um it's all like a blur mm -hmm. uh, it's was the fat even though it was during the pandemic which seemed to drag out in some ways looking back it's the fastest five years of my life i've ever experienced but each day is almost like its own entity in and of itself because so many things have come to light during that time. So it's just a mind blowing, you know, fast, but also like living in a movie. Mm. Yeah. What was, to, let's go back to the fear piece. What or how did you overcome it? How, because fear is, fear is common, but a lot of times it'll shut us down, right? We'll step back from stepping into it. What was your, strategy or thought process to say, no, I got to just handle this. 
Well, I think it was two parts of it. Um, part of it being, um, I felt that I didn't have um, anything to lose. Um, and then the other part was really friendship. Uh, you know, I, I, like I mentioned before, I'm in my mid fifties, so I've lived a little bit of life and, um, you know, you make good and bad choices. And while we're certainly greater than the worst thing we've ever done, I feel like there's times in life I haven't been the best friend or made the best choices. And I felt like this was just one of those times in life where no matter how hard it, it was going to be, and I thought it was going to be hard. It's not like <laughs> I, I definitely recognize the danger and mm -hmm. the pitfalls and what could go wrong. Um, but it was really that childhood bond of being friends with someone since I was three years old and so, and having a little bit of maturity to say, I want to be that friend that goes the distance. Yeah, that's powerful. I, I think that's – you hit on a few things there, but I think one of the big ones is that when we're doing stuff, when we're doing things for others, we, we can kind of take risks that maybe we wouldn't take for ourselves, right, or face fears that maybe we – 100%. I would have never done it for myself, <laughs> and then that's maybe a little bit sad to say. I think I'm getting better at that and yeah. um, valuing, uh, you know, myself and being my own champion. I tell people all the time, we have to be our own best cheerleader. We have to love and believe in ourselves if we want others to. But in that difficult, hard moment, it was certainly, um, you know, how many people can say they've been best friends for five decades? Right. Uh, you know, to me, that was something so special. Um, and I'm the more, we're like Bert and Ernie, we have very <laughs> different personalities and I'm the outgoing outspoken yeah. one. She's not somebody who's going to, you know, um, go public and, and go meet with lawmakers or go to the media or whatever. And I had all these media connections from platforming, um, victims in different arenas over the years. So I just felt like, um, you know, while it was a tough job to, to take on that, I did have some things in my wheelhouse that could make it possible. And I do know that I am, uh, a resilient person. I've experienced a lot of things throughout my lifetime, like my daughter having stage four cancer and being a survivor. That's quite an experience. I was in a car wreck when I was a kid. I've lived with a brain injury since I was nine years old and have had to overcome that. I lost my son in 2014 to chronic traumatic encephalopathy from playing youth tackle football. Um, so I had bounced back. You know, I'd lived through some stuff. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to make it through this too. I have a 100% track record of making it through <laughs> things I didn't think I could do. So. <laughs> That's that was my truth. mindset. I love it with a, a, a success record like that. Why wouldn't you, right? You're 100%. Um, but she also needed you. Yeah, and 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 I needed uh, the chance to, you know, um, show myself that um, I had learned lessons in life and that I could apply them. And so, you know, it was a very um, give and take sort of thing. Like she needed me and I needed her for different reasons. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm always, um, I love when I see whether you call it like God or the universe, however you like to phrase it or whatever context, when things come together and you're like, okay, this came together at this time because it was meant to be. Like we were meant to be here. We both needed something from this. We both had something to give. And, I think at times maybe we don't pay enough attention to those moments. Or... Definitely not. I think for her and I, we had something that was really unique. Um, when we were uh, 10 years old, there was like this trend going around. So, you know, imagine we grew up in this little small town in Northern California that I always tease is more like being from like a small town in Arkansas than California because this is a little country town. 
And there was a little trend going around called Blood Sisters, where you would poke <laughs> your finger and rub your fingers together. Oh, yeah. Well, we did this, but I was always kind of a quirky person. And so I wrote up a contract <laughs> and we had two copies and I saw, you know, we signed them. We had a witness. We had two witness lines, but apparently we could only wrangle up one neighborhood kid <laughs> to witness our, our, our ritual or whatever. And so we each had this contract and um, hers burnt in the fire, but I still have mine, the original from 1979. It has the pin that we poked our finger with and the Band-Aid that um, I used to cover my little uh, wound that I created <laughs> for our bond. And so, you know, we always tease that we're here by contractually binding agreement from 1979. <laughs> so don't mess with us. This is legit. So you were always <laughs> headed towards some kind of a legal profession, even as a young person. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, At least an advocate of sorts yeah. or, you know, yeah. I love it. Let me ask you this. How have you, because one of the things I noticed too is you're, you're very – energetically when I watch your interviews and I listen to you on a couple other shows, you're, you're very upbeat. You're very positive. You have good energy. How have you been able to protect your peace while going through so much, something that's so painful to so many others? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, I have a philosophy, you know, you heal what you feel. And I've always been a person to feel everything good, bad, or indifferent. So in the moment, like I, I am, you know, known to show my emotions, which is not always allowed in certain situations in society. People expect you to kind of hold in um, your emotions. I wasn't necessarily a big crier until after I lost my son. Now I would include that emotion in something I'm willing to share publicly with people um and then you know just also like i i have this sort of thing that's just innate i don't think i learned it i think i was born with it is that i'm not afraid to get close to people even if like say that person's gonna die or move away or whatever um you know relationships and situations aren't always for a lifetime and I'm willing to recognize the value of that moment, even if the moment's not going to last, um, you know, forever. So I feel like those two things are, you know, what have gotten me through. And it did take a pretty big toll on me um, leading up to right before this kind of all went public five years ago. But I got lucky or maybe sort of like what you were saying before, how the universe sort yeah. of works and sometimes really works in our favor. I stumbled into a lunch at a legal conference and who is giving the, the um, who's the speaker of the day? It was Brian Stevenson, the guy who wrote the book, Just Mercy. And there was the movie about him. Jamie Foxx yep. um, was in the movie and Michael B. Jordan um, played Brian Stevenson. And he gave this talk that just blew me away. And I'm sitting in this legal luncheon with all these, you know, hobnobby big lawyers. And I'm crying because I feel like he's talking to me sure. directly. And one of the things he's saying is that it's okay to get close to people. Don't let, you know, because in the legal mm -hmm. profession, they tell you to compartmentalize. And he's saying, no, that's your gift. And for a couple of years I had been struggling with, should I not get so close to people or get so close to the fire? Am I just burning my own self because I can't, you know, I'm like a moth to a flame. Mm -hmm. um, and listening to his speech, I mean, I was struggling mentally big time. And in that moment, it just changed on a dime. Like he validated um, so much of the gifts that I have to help people that I was starting to wonder, you know, are they weaknesses rather than strengths? And he just opened my eyes and gave me um, just like he reignited the fire in me that I needed to keep going forward. And so, of course, I left the lunch 
And I emailed him right away. I, you know, stalked him on the internet, found an email <laughs> for him, you know, wrote him a thing thinking he's never going to answer me back. Right. Never. Right. I sent him this big old email. I explained to him how, how difficult a time I'd been having and that I almost didn't go to that luncheon. And I just felt like it was a, a message straight from God. And he writes me back like 20 minutes later and I'm floored, right? I'm reading the email going, oh my God. And I don't even know how famous he is really at that point. Sure. I mean, I knew he had a book or whatever, but I didn't know a movie was coming or anything like that. It was all just sort of in the moment. And he tells me I almost didn't make it to that luncheon. Our flight was stuck for oh. on the tarmac for eight hours. I was up all night. I didn't sleep. When I finally landed in San Francisco, I almost canceled. He said, but something told me to do it. And he said, I think I was there to talk to you. Mm. And wow, it's been, a, it's still, I think about it all the time. What if I wouldn't have gone to that lunch and where would I be today? So we have those moments in life that just sort of catapult you forward. And I feel like uh, meeting him was most definitely, uh, and not just a speech, the the email he wrote back in return, uh, just a game changer for me. And it just, I think it's a reminder to answer that email, to, to you know, be there in the moment for as many people as you can. You can't always do it for everyone. But you never know when you're going to make a difference in someone's life just by being who you are. Oh, powerful. I 100% agree just by showing up, right? Like, yep. sometimes you don't know, but if you don't show up, you'll never know. Yep. Yeah. Just and, it's it's crazy, uh, you know, and uh, what what a great message he has. I mean, of course, I'm a little biased because of my experience with them, but it's a great book. If no one's read it, you know, people listening, haven't read it. Mm -hmm. It's a really great book. And, and into this whole topic we're talking about, because he was dealing with people on death row. And that's what really caught me is that if this guy can help people who are on death row and when he's not successful, they're killed, they're executed and keep going. Okay. Yeah. I can do it too. I, I can do this. Yeah, I love that. And I love um, that you were just so open to learning, right? Because I think that's the other part. The, the part of show is showing up, just being in places where we're supposed to be or where we think we're supposed to be. And then I think the other big piece is showing up open with an expectation or a willingness to learn whatever's being delivered. Yeah, I think being a lifelong learner and enjoying learning new things. I've done different jobs or had a lot of different hobbies that turned into things like people tease me all the time when they get to know me a little bit. What haven't you done? <laughs> oh, there's a lot of stuff. Don't worry. I got a ways to go. <laughs> I have other things that I'm learning to play the guitar right now. Oh, and nice. I just started and I plan to join a band. I tell everybody I'm going to join a rock band and they laugh at me, but I'm serious. Well, if you got any room for a ukulele player, I just picked it up on my 50th birthday. I never played any musical instrument. I was like, that's crazy. Like, I've been alive 50 years. I love music. So I, my sister gave me a ukulele. So if you got room for a ukulele uh, nice. player, I'm in. We'll start a band. Well, I only know like five <laughs> songs, so it's going to be a short tour because I know five songs. I know a couple of chords so far. That's <laughs> it. I'm not good enough to play in front of anybody, um, but I, I've told myself uh, I'm going to start dedicating. I, I've now put it on like the to-do list, mm. so now it's a, it's a daily thing because if you spend even 20 minutes a day on something, you know, you'll be 95%, you know, better than, better than 95% of the people around you if you'll dedicate 20 minutes a day. And you're, and you're 100% better than you were before that 20 minutes. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I just, I just love being able to talk with you. And that's probably one of my favorite things about this show is getting to meet people, through the joys of technology that maybe our past hadn't crossed in real life, but we're crossing now for a reason. But I don't want your story to be all about this case because I, I, I'm like, there's so much I want to be able to share with you. And one of the things that I was intrigued about is 
When did you first notice you had a tenacity to fight when maybe others would stay silent about something that was wrong around them? As long as I can remember. Like, so, you know, like six I was years that old? kid in school. I was that kid in school that, you know, if they picked on a kid, let's say they had there was a one girl that I always think about um, she had, you know, the big headgear braces, you know, mm. remember when they would oh. do that to a kid, which I think is so mean, I she should have came up that. with another way to fix someone's teeth. Oh. But, you know, she had the big old headgear and she had like Coke bottle glasses and we were in middle school by this time. Um, but people, I, I went to the same school from kindergarten through high school. So everyone knew me, um, but you know, kids would pick on her. And man, you know, I would come for them. Like, you give me a break. And I was always a really big kid, meaning tall. I'm five nine, and I was that height by eighth grade. <laughs> so, you know, I just, it was more my demeanor, I think, than just my size. Yeah. Um, I just felt like it was my job to stand up for people who couldn't stand up for themselves. And um, I got a sense of, um, belonging and a sense of like my own self. Like I just felt like that was a part of who I was that when I could, that, you know, it, that I should stand up for people who couldn't stand up for themselves. And, you know, throughout, um, elementary, middle school, high school, you just get a lot of those oh. opportunities to be that person. <laughs> and, you know, people made jokes, you know, that, um, I was sort of a bully back to the bullies. And I'm like, how can you be like, if they're the bullies, then I'm not the, like, that doesn't even make sense, <laughs> but I didn't care. And I would stand up to boys and girls. It didn't matter to me, the gender. Um, and I was that kind of kid who would literally just stand in your face, toe to toe and say, test me and try me, see if I will back down or not, because I'm not going to. And I just never did. So I always had that sort of fight in me to stand up for kids that, you know, were, were being bullied. So it was a natural thing that I ended up being a child rights advocate. Yeah. Where do you think um, that just, came from? Was it? I don't know. I mean, it really like me and my best friend talk about it all the time. <laughs> you know, we go back to it, uh, you know, when things come up now in, in our adult life. And we both say, you know, why, how did I get that way? That was the first time I ever met Tom Girardi. He said to me, how did you get this way? Really? That was his question to me. And it was such a weird way he said it. I never forgot it. How did you get this way? Like, and I, that's why I say I just had to be born this way because I have no memory of myself without that quality. Um, I just feel like it was, you know, destiny or my purpose. Um, it was just a part of me to mm. be that person to stand up for, you know, what I thought was right. Mm. Do you have siblings? I do. I had two sisters and a brother. I'm the baby. So oh. maybe that was part of it. I did. <laughs> I think it, <laughs> you know, the younger kid syndrome yeah. uh, kind of thing. And of course, you know, older brothers, um, you know, they can be a handful when you're growing up because, you know, they do okay. what big brothers do. They tickle you to death. They chase you. They do, you know, they make you play on teams where you're the youngest, the smallest, the least likely to be good at it. Um, in that, in that sort of thing, you know, so yeah. he probably, uh, built me up too, to be, uh, that, you know, person that would stand up, you know, for others. So probably being the youngest had a little, little bit to do with that. Um, you know, for sure. What do uh, what do your siblings say to you now that you're doing so well fighting for so many? Um, you know, it's funny. Like they don't <laughs> their typical like family. Like they already know how, how I am. I mean, like uh, when people needed someone to call and like get a refund or <laughs> you know, deal with the school district for their kid or whatever, you know, everyone calls me. So it's like to them they don't really see it as being like a national or a global thing or to the level that it is now. They just still see you as the little sister and that you're just doing what you've always done, you know? So I guess that's probably a good way to keep somebody humble. 
um, is just, you know, Hey, I don't see you any different than I did when we were like 11, right? you know, and, and you were going up against the bully at school or in the neighborhood or whatever. Um, but I know that they're proud, especially of my stance against Girardi and, um, you know, stealing from people who are already victims when they came to him. Um, I know that they're proud of that and they're, they're shocked on Monday, uh, um, the 12th, I have a new documentary coming out called Housewife and the Hustler 2 on Hulu. Okay. And um, the trailer came out already and it's gotten quite the buzz. And of course, my quote is, um, you know, don't be an asshole to victims, mm. which is very on brand for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so not talking, I, I said uh, to the producer, I go, I said that? I don't remember saying that. Uh, yeah. And I said it, I was swearing. Anyway, I have a potty mouth, especially when I'm talking passionately about the rights of others that are, you know, just being mowed over. Um, I, I can get worked up about it. Yeah, well, I'll be honest. I'm glad you do because I it needs somebody with that kind of passion, with that energy, and with the courage to step up to give folks voices. You know, our- yeah, people need a voice for sure. And that's, that's, there's nothing worse than being a victim and feeling voiceless, mm. you know, um, to feel, to, you know, it's one thing to feel sadness and to feel, you know, frustrated and um, to feel powerless, but to feel hopeless. To me, that's the root of depression, mm. the root of, um, you know, where like suicidal thoughts come from. And some of the really dark mental illness stuff is when you feel hopeless, what do you have? Like hope's not a strategy, but it's required Mm. for good mental health. You got to have hope. And so when someone stands up for you and gives you a voice or is the voice for you, you can now cling on to that hope and you can make it. Mm. Well, as our good friend, Zach Mercurio, if you ever get a chance to, Read his book, The Invisible Leader. He's been on the show a couple times. He's got his PhD in purpose, the study of purpose and mattering. What he would say right there is that what you're doing is letting these folks that don't have a voice know they matter, right? They at least matter to you. If they can't find anybody else they matter to, they matter to you. And once they, people start understanding they matter, then they can find hope and purpose and fight forward because at least they know one person cares about them well i can agree with that for sure that that every person i've ever helped i see them i can see them where they're at i can meet them where they're at and i see their value and why they matter and Mm -hmm. and and for a long time we used to use the hashtag kids matter when we talked about child rights um you know and and um we say as a society that we love kids and that we want to protect them and all this stuff, but our policies and our laws, you know, don't really reflect that. I had someone recently say to me, I was trying to explain to him when I'd walk the halls of Congress, it could be really um, depressing because nobody seemed to really care about kids. And he said, yeah, kids don't vote. And I was like, ah, that's like a stab to the heart. I was Mm -hmm. like, that's a very good point, but I really don't like where that goes, you know? And and so, yeah, our lawmakers have a difficult time seeing children's points of view as, uh, you know, um, having value because they don't vote or they can't vote now. I would say, well, they can vote later, though. And, um, you know, that could make a difference. And And hopefully they have a long memory. That's the long game. Right. Right. Hopefully they have a long memory to, to remember moments like that. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk. So you, you're a very visible spokesperson for cheer safety and sports, right? Through, through your daughters and your involvement in the sport of cheerleading, as well as uh, the ongoing battle with CTE. And, and really, I mean, that's, I'm a lifelong athlete and I'm about your same age. So that's just something that we've really even started to recognize as an issue in what, the last 10 years, maybe? Yeah, so I started, uh, I had my 20 year anniversary as a child rights um, activist. So I started in 2003. 
and I was on an island all by myself. Um, people said I was pretty crazy to have these <laughs> big ideas. Um, and I used to say, yeah, crazy good. I mean, you know, whatever. Right. Um, y- you got to have uh, some passion and gumption to take on like a topic that really hasn't been addressed in society. And so, yeah, my daughter got injured on her high school cheer team. She broke her arm. It was a double compound fracture. So her both of her bones were sticking out of her arm and she had to have a metal plate put in her arm and go through physical therapy and all this stuff. But what what caught me is that I was a typical parent at the gymnastics gym where her team was taking gymnastics lessons for her sideline shirt team. And I'm writing my check like all good parents do for all the stuff that we do for our kids. Yeah. And I hear this crazy sound and they're like, Oh, that was your kid just got injured. And I'm like, what? I mean, the sound of her bones Uh. breaking, I will never forget. I go running over to her And just what was shocking is what happened after that. They had no first aid kit, no emergency plan. No one really was jumping into action to know what to do. Thank God I was there. We cut up a piece of carpet, made a sling, and I picked her up and carried her to the car. Good thing I'm a strong person. Carried her to the car, drove her to the ER, and, you know, and went from there. Well, the doctor saw it as child abuse improper supervision so it set off a chain of events that changed my whole life Mm -hmm. so our insurance wouldn't cover it because it's child maltreatment which was not so i got to pay for all of it single mom i worked two jobs so i got to pay like 12 grand this was in you know 2003 so to pay all that money out of my own pocket was just outrageous to me and for nothing to happen to the people who were the negligent supervisor seemed crazy. My daughter did not want to sue the school, which I honored her wishes, sure. even though she was a teenager. But, you know, um, it's also her life, too. And I knew when she turned 18, if she wanted to um, uh, sue, then she could. She'd have another chance as an adult to look at it different. Um, and she still didn't want to sue, but by that time, um, I had, uh, you know, sold my company that I had at the time and it had been like a full-time advocate for child rights. A friend gave me a book called raising the bar, which was the name of my company, raising the bar fundraising. I did school fundraisers for schools and nonprofits. And it was all about how Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who wasn't a Supreme Court justice back then, um, had used litigation to further women's rights. And so I read the book and went, oh, yeah, I have zero, um, you know, I'm not going to be a Supreme Court justice. I'm not an attorney. But I thought the idea of how she did it made a lot of sense, like, you know, we're going to need to use litigation to really change the rights of kids in sports. Mm. And I had coached and I had cheered. And so lo and behold, I realized, oh, well, I have the background to be an expert witness for kids in cheerleading um, because of my background. So I'm not an attorney, but I actually am a subject matter expert. Oh, wow. So I started um, working with attorneys on cheerleading injury cases um, as an expert, which led me to do both plaintiff and defense work. Not not mm-hmm. a lot of defense work because most defense lawyers just don't call me. They don't <laughs> think that I'll, that I'll help their side per se, um, but some do. And if the coach has been wrongfully accused, of course I would be their expert. That's not fair either. Sure. I'm all about being fair. So if they're being, um, you know, what they're, what they did is being misconstrued, um, then obviously I would stand up for them, you know, just as much as I would a kid. Um, and that just sort of evolved over the years and I've worked on a number of landmark cases. I think that one of the ones I'm the most proud of would be the case against us soccer. So there was a big, lawsuit against U.S. soccer for concussions and brain injury and exposure to repetitive hits from headers. And um, the case was thrown out initially 
and a good friend of mine, Catherine Snedeker, who um, founded the nonprofit Pink Concussions. She knew the attorney and had been telling the attorney, you should call Kimberly Archie. Like, this is her thing. And they were like, she's not a lawyer, though. You know, they just weren't Mm -hmm. connecting the dots. But when they got their case thrown out, they had a chance to refile it. So when they did, that's when they contacted me. And I shared my, you know, 15 years of research on what I call child athlete abuse disorder and how they could use those strategies to argue their case to take headers out of soccer and to count hits and um, to change sort of, you know, swing the pendulum for child rights in sports. And sure enough, I had one meeting. It was like eight hour meeting, but one meeting with the attorneys. They took what I gave them, went and had a mediation. They didn't even have to refile the case. This is all people can look it up. And um, U.S. soccer agreed to count headers for kids from 11 to 13, to take headers out for 10 and under. um, And they paid all the attorney fees and all the things to settle the case. And, you know, now we have, uh, you know, we made history, really. It's been very influential in other cases as well. And it's set a standard that we shouldn't just count pitches in baseball to protect kids from repetitive mm. um, injuries because hits are greater than motion. I mean, all this sure. argument about CTE and semantics and and research and yada, yada, yada. I mean, let's just keep it simple um, for, for us regular folks. Uh, hits are greater than motion. If you can throw the ball too many times and blow out your elbow, if you hit your head hundreds of thousands of times, you're probably – going to injure it um, not just in the moment but for the long term Mm. and the thing that I use to describe to parents to make it really simple again is just think of your kid's brain as a glass of water and every time your kid takes a hit a little water spills out they take a big hit more water spills out how much water do you want in their glass when they turn 18 Mm. you want it to be empty Right. We, we have to think about these things. We have to think about brain health for the long term. The brain is a lot more fragile than we wanted to believe. You know, we want to think we're tough and we want to create um, toughness in our kids so that they can have the tools to get through life. But we don't want to cause brain damage, you know, playing games or doing things that are considered fun and good for our kids. And 10, 20 years later, their brain health is destroyed. That's the one organ in the body that sure. can't just repair itself. Yeah, absolutely. So let me go back to that case against U.S. soccer. You That was brought on by some families that um, – there, there wasn't any injury. So the case okay. was called Mare versus U.S. soccer. And it was, it was an attorney who also was very involved in okay. soccer – and saw that, you know, there were issues with brain health in soccer and it not being taken serious at the youth level. And so, you know, their focus was initially concussion, mm. which was kind of part of the downfall. Instead of, you know, you know, the saying is that you don't see the forest for the trees. Right. They were just very narrowly focused on concussion. Their intent was exactly right. But their point of view, they just sort of got lost. If anybody's ever seen the movie Patch Adams, you know, there's a scene that repeats where the guy keeps holding up the fingers to Robin Williams' character saying, how many fingers do you see? (laughs) And he's only seeing the number he's holding up. And when he finally can see past and see the whole picture, the fingers blur and you see six. Well, that's really what happened in the U.S. soccer case. They just kept seeing the three fingers, the concussion, the concussion. But when they met with me, I helped them see the totality of brain health and what the issues are and how to take what we learned in workers' comp law with repetitive injuries in the workplace and apply that to children and brain health. And all the lights came on and it was far easier. And of course, even the defense, it's hard to argue when you explain it like that because now, yes, you need to use peer reviewed scientific research to argue your points in a court of law, especially if it's a federal case. But common sense sure goes a long way. 
if you can explain it like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I like, I like what you were arguing there was a balance, right? Like sports are important for kids, but also the kids don't know the safety measures, right? They're, they're little, they don't understand everything. And we, we have an obligation to protect them by creating safe sports. Exactly. Safe and age appropriate. It should be, the law is clear that we owe a special duty to children and that it should be reasonably safe and mm-hmm. age appropriate. And this is where we get into the argument about tackle football. I don't think we should ban tackle football. I think we need to make football age appropriate for each age group. And, you know, in the 50s and 60s, uh, we didn't allow kids to play contact sports and we didn't allow them to play commercialized sports before the age of 12. That was the lobbying of the sports industry. And I found this out by looking at the old newspaper articles. Remember how we <laughs> talked about that at the beginning? So we're going, yeah. we're coming full circle. Amen. I read hundreds of newspaper articles from the ni- early 1900s to the present. And I watched how it changed over the years. We were doing the right thing in the 50s and 60s, you know, which is a pretty like for Americans, when you look back at the 50s and 60s, that's like the leave it to beaver era. That's kind of gives us all like warm, fuzzy stuff. That's all we're saying. And a lot of us want to go back to that in some senses that we thought that was such kind of a golden era for families and that sort of thing. And we weren't allowing kids to be involved in the commercialization of sports. We wanted them to play and have fun and like i always say america loves sports but we need to love kids just as much because they're our future Mm, that's fantastic kimberly it's been uh an honor and a very humbling privilege to have you on the show but before i wrap up with you i at least want to touch briefly on paul's ice cream company because when I read oh. that and I, I saw what you were doing there, I was like, oh, man, one, I love ice cream. And two, I love ice cream with a good cause. Yeah, who doesn't love ice cream? I don't know. <laughs> you don't like ice cream? I'm, I might judge you. That might be the one thing that makes me look at you a little set. Like, yeah. really? You don't like any flavors? Oh, what about vegan? Mm. What about, you know, uh, there's all different types of ice cream. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, Paul's Ice Cream Company um, – started a couple of years ago during the pandemic like most people you know we're trapped in our houses and people were baking bread and all kinds of stuff um and so i ordered an ice cream machine because i'm a pie maker and i always wondered why i never made ice cream to go with these great pies that everyone loved so i started making ice cream and of course i was like pawning it off on my neighbors and stuff to see what they thought and they were all freaking out over this ice cream. And I'm thinking, wow, is it really that good? Um, So I started doing some um, events for friends for free, just, you know, for fun. It was like a hobby. And then I started going to this uh, restaurant in my neighborhood and I started giving it out to people at the restaurant and to the owners. And they were like, you need to turn this into a business. <laughs> and so the owner of the restaurants called the Valley Inn um, restaurant and bar in Sherman Oaks. It's the oldest restaurant in the San Fernando Valley here in, in Los Angeles County. It's been there 77 years, which is unbelievable. They yeah. made it through the pandemic. Thank God. And they said, why don't you just have an event at our restaurant? They literally just, I, I tell her, you get all the credit or all the blame, one way, <laughs> whatever it is, it's all you. Right. Because the owner of the restaurant said, let's do an event and you can have it at the restaurant. We'll open up the restaurant, you know, during the time that we're closed and, um, and you can do an event. So I picked National Ice Cream Day because why not? Yeah. And then um, – I named the company Paul's ice cream company after my son who passed away. That was the chef. Um, Cause it was his dream to own a restaurant. And I didn't think I would ever do that. So this was sort of my own little nod to his dream. And um, because I love a good cause. And so did he, that was a, a big part of who my son was, um, was just helping people, you know, he would bring in stray animals and stop and help people who are stranded on the side of the road or give people rides or what he's just constantly doing that kind of stuff. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun if each flavor would be connected to a cause or a nonprofit 
and um, if we did our events for charity. So um, while it's a business, the money we raise goes to charity. So we've done, for now, it's a pop-up business that we do for um, charity events. And so people just contact me and say, you know, will you do such and such event? You got it. If we can do it, we do it. So we've raised money for all kinds of different charities over the last year. And we're now planning our second annual National Ice Cream Day. Um which will be July 21st. And um, last year we raised money for No Birthday Left Behind, which is a nonprofit mm. that raises money to give birthday parties for kids who are unhoused, which I mean, how yeah. much more like, I don't know. I don't know what a better cause <laughs> that, you know, there are a lot of great causes, but to yeah. me, especially in the day and age we're living in, um, to, no kid should go without a birthday. Right. And to feel special on their birthday. Talk about wanting to feel like you matter. Imagine not getting a cake on your birthday and you're eight years old and you're in a homeless shelter. Yeah. Uh, you know, to me, oh my gosh. So we will be doing it again for no birthday left behind. And um, they're just a great cause. The a young teenager started the nonprofit after volunteering at a homeless shelter, and she said to her mom and dad, did they get birthday parties like I get? And of course they said no. And so she started a nonprofit and now they have chapters around the U S and they do hundreds of parties every month for kids who would not get a party at all. Mm, I love it. What is your favorite flavor you make? You know, my favorite flavor to eat is Rocky Road. So oh, I thought so that was going to be my favorite flavor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my son's favorite was strawberry. So I should have known better. Mm. Um, strawberry is my favorite flavor that I make. And I think it's because we don't use any chemicals to make our ice cream. And um, so we don't use pink dye. It's it's a beautiful pink color because of all the strawberry that we use in it. So, you know, if you've ever had strawberry ice cream and most people have, yeah. you know, you taste it and you see it's pink, but your taste buds are kind of saying there's not enough strawberry in here. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, it just has so much strawberry flavor in it. I think it surprises people. Mm, I love it. Kimberly, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Where can our audience connect with you to stay up to date on all the, the amazing stuff you're doing in the world? Well, I am on um, social media. Um, they can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, as well as uh, TikTok. Um, I'm just starting my TikTok channel. I'll be launching it next week. So okay. I'm going to start. I'm, I'm I'm entering into the TikTok world, so uh, pray for me. That'll be a, it's an interesting change. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, Kimberly, thanks again for joining us. It's been a pleasure to share your story with our community. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And remember, team, life is far too short to live any other way than on purpose. We'll see you all again next week. Mm -hmm.